Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today's guest is Jonathan Asley. The focus of America's leading midlife dating coach has expanded into a deeper, essential philosophy of what it truly means to love. After losing his 19-year-old son, Connor, in 2018, Jonathan Asley's grief led him on a soul-searching inner journey, where he became aware of an often overlooked dimension of the dating conversation. He realized that the process of dating reveals the most common emotional health issue faced by many singles seeking a partner, a distressing life lack of self-worth, self-regard, and self-love. Today, he is on a mission of encouraging both men and women to fully love themselves with the new book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway?, packed with fun, engaging, spiritual, and personal growth practices, and his dynamic midlife love mastery mentor program that inspires hundreds of people daily around the world. You're going to love my next guest. He's going to be talking about dating after divorce, but more importantly, how to bring your best self to the process. If you were wondering why dating may have been a bit tricky post-divorce, you're going to hear exactly why. Here's Jonathan. Okay, everybody, we have Jonathan Asley with us today. This is going to be a very interesting conversation because this is all about dating. What? Dating with love and self-love and all things love. And he has uh, just a very powerful, interesting short story to share. So welcome, Jonathan. We're so glad to have you join us. Oh, I'm so grateful to be here, Dr. Debbie. Uh, <laughs> and I want to call you Dr. Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's funny because before I hit record, Jonathan asked, and I, I said, well, you can call me Debbie. And he just insisted on the doctor part. So, okay. That's- well, I think it's kind of sexy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you this early in the morning. Uh, right. Wonderful. Let's just talk about, let's just get started right with, you know, your divorce and and where was your head in in that space and how did you navigate that and all things that went with it oh my gosh you know it's interesting because um you know i after my divorce one of the first things i did was online dating and and i i'm sharing this because um i was in an unhappy marriage and i don't want to go into the particulars of that although there's some dynamics that affect what i'm about to share but my initial reaction was to meet someone right away. And I went, this thing called online dating was relatively new about a decade and a half ago. And I thought you could plug exactly what you want and someone would magically appear. And when I met a nice woman, went on a great date that something wasn't right. And then a couple days later, same thing. Met a nice woman, went on a great date, something wasn't right. And this happened over and over again. And what I realized that the something wasn't right was me. Mm -hmm. And, and let me, and I didn't say this a second ago, I went on a hundred internet dates in one year. So that's what gave me the clue. So this something wasn't right was me. And, um, it's interesting because I remember it communicating with one woman, uh, early on. And she said, how long you've been divorced? And I go, well, I'm not divorced. We're separated. And she writes me back and says, reach out to me after you've, it's been 18 to 24 months that you've been divorced and you've had one or two transition relationships. Oh, wow. And at the time I was like, no, I'm ready for a relationship. I'm ready for a relationship. And then two years later, I saw her again online and I wrote her and I said, you were right. I so wasn't ready for a relationship. I had, I did have one or two transition relationships. What I mean is I leaned into a relationship and found myself so not ready. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. not ready, even though cognitively I thought I was ready, but emotionally I wasn't ready. And I'm going to stop you right there because, you know, obviously this is all about healing from betrayal. And there are so many people listening to this episode who are saying, well, you know what? I just, there's this deep pain and this, this hole in my heart and I just want it filled. So let me get back out there. And I tell them that I I wish I had, you know, like when a website is under construction, there's that big under construction. I wish they, I had a stamp that I can put on everybody that says under construction, because when you're out of a relationship, that is the perfect opportunity to become your physical, mental, emotional, psychological, and spiritual best. And you will never just, if you go into that next relationship, you're bringing the same old version of you. And how could you have anything but more of the same? And it sounds like that's what you experienced. Yeah. And so great, great way of framing that because what was going on is I was unraveling the tapestry of my old life and hadn't really began a 
integration of my own sovereignty through personal development, self-help, and spiritual work. And, and you'll get a kick out of this story, though. It was about nine months into my dating. I met this woman, and we just had a great connection. She was the first relationship I had. And on the, I think it was on her third date, she said, Jonathan, I have to date you with rose-colored glasses. I go, what do you mean? She goes, you're not ready for a relationship. I go, no, no, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. And she goes, no, you're not. And in fact, for Christmas, we dated right before Christmas. She gave me a box picture frame of rose-colored glasses. I still have it on my desk <laughs> you know, 15 years later because she was so right. Three months in, I wasn't. And I recognize, that's why I said, after those 100 dates, I recognized that I was the consistent, I don't want to say problem, but I was the cause of a lot of what was going on. So it required going inward. And I began literally, I think right after that, the movie The Secret came out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, this resonates with me. And it wasn't just the law of attraction, but personal development, self-help, spiritual work, therapy, all these things. Because to some degree, I was betraying myself this whole time. I was betraying who I was by not really discovering who I was mm -hmm. as a sovereign soul person. No, it's, it's like you weren't giving yourself an opportunity to become this highest and best version of you that was kind of waiting to be birthed. Yeah, exactly. And so, and it didn't happen. You, you just can't go to one seminar or one therapy session or one thing and all of a sudden go, ah, oh, I've healed. You know, mm -hmm. healing is like peeling an onion. It's a, it's a continual process. It's, for me, it's a daily practice. And that's what I invite my clients and the world, if you will, to do is to begin a daily practice of working on oneself. And when I say the word work, and you know what I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. is, is really healing and forgiving because there were so many layers that led up to where I was at at this point in my life of negative patterns and limiting beliefs that has just been pounded upon one after another, after another, after another. So what were some changes that you noticed as you dove into this personal development work and you, you know, you, you started a daily practice? What changes did you feel? Did you see? Who well, did you start I, becoming? You know, it's interesting because I had a script playing in my head that I'm stupid. And that script was written when I was in third grade, when my te you know, I was a very uh, boisterous child, you know, the clown, class clown, that sort of thing. And I was just, back then they call it high strung, now they call it ADD. Mm -hmm. um, I was always put at the back of the class. And one time one teacher said, you're stupid in front of everyone in the class. Wow. So that was a script running in my head for 50 decades. Yeah. And when I discovered that script, what happened was there was an interesting corresponding opposite that would occur. So anytime I was, I felt like I knew something, like I knew something, like I, I knew it. I communicated in an incredibly righteous way. Mm -hmm. I credit mm -hmm. pompously. So pick to overcome or to kind of be the contrast of feeling stupid. So I, I named this limiting character I have called stupid righteous Jack mm -hmm. because I'm now aware that that happens, that occurs. And by being aware of it, I can either catch myself in the moment or if I don't, and this just happened the other night, I was doing a speaking gig and, <laughs> and I, we were having a little cocktail party afterwards and I went into my pompousness, mm -hmm. you know, that righteous place of mm -hmm. who I am. Mm -hmm. I was pontificating. And I stopped about a minute later and I shared with everyone, this is what was going on. And, and that's an amazing that you, that you stopped, that you caught yourself and you stopped yourself. You know, it's like you can't, awareness is the first step to change and just to become yeah. aware, first of all, that this is what you're doing enough that you could do something differently. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So then this, the, the personal development sort of had you take a look and say, okay, you know what? I'm not stupid and, and I'm, I'm growing and I'm changing. Yeah. I mean, were there certain, I'd love to know where there's certain, um, thought leaders that you really resonated with and, and you followed? Yeah, you know, it started with, um, well, interesting enough, the first book I ever got 20 plus years ago was called You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. Mm -hmm. And that was an introduction to metaphysics. But 
I got married and I stopped a practice of, of really self-discovery when I got married. And so then after my divorce, you know, Tony Robbins was the big one. I mean, he was on every infomercial. He was on TV. Mm -hmm. I, bought, I bought his CDs about a decade earlier and they were still in a box. <laughs> the Giant <laughs> Within? That's the one yeah, I Yeah, exactly. Had. Yep, I hear you. I mean, Awaken the Giant Within. Awaken the Giant, Or something yep. like that, yeah. Uh -huh. but, uh, and I mean, I had the CD set and it was in a box. Uh, and I finally peeled that open. I fell in, after that, I fell in love with Wayne Dyer, Abraham, Abraham Hicks. Mm -hmm. um, then I read the book Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. And yeah. I just, that's my Bible, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, uh, Marianne Williamson, Return to Love. Oh, the and, best. The and best. I also have done the Hoffman process, which is a deep dive into our childhood wounds and like mm -hmm. I said before limiting pattern negative patterns and limiting beliefs and I've done the insight seminars I I do my best to at least every quarter do something mm -hmm. of healing and and forgiveness as a and that's my daily practice um, and I, I would love to dive in deeper too and and every everybody you mentioned I, I haven't done the Hoffman process but every all the other ones are just incredible life-changing that's what's yeah. been lining my bookshelves forever L I want to talk about forgiveness but before I get there um, I, I know you lost your son I'm so yeah. terribly sorry about that how did that how did that open you up to a self-love practice because I know that's something that is Unique, unique. I, I really believe because so many people uh, in that deep trauma. I don't know if they would, if if self love would be their route out of it. Yeah, this that that's that that was something that you that you found. Thank you for allowing me to share this because this is a pivotal part of my journey and my work because. When my, and for those listening, um, on July 3rd, 2018, I lost my 19 year old son Connor to an accident. And as any parent listening to this knows, our greatest fear, or, you know, for a worst nightmare is the idea of losing a child or losing our children. And in this, and I'm experiencing this, I mean, now, bam, it's happened to me. I never thought it would, but I feared it, but I never thought it would. Um, I made a conscious choice. Uh, I was at it was at the funeral and I'm giving the eulogy and I stopped in the middle of it and I said to the audience um, or to my friends, I'm not going to grieve through pain and suffering. I'm going to grieve with love. And why I was capable of doing that, because I, I feel as though it was the 15 years of work I did prior Mm -hmm. The personal development, the self-help, the spiritual work was a bit, it was like a vaccination to emotional chaos. I was, mm -hmm. that was preparing me for this. So, and now that occurred because I went through a significant trauma 15 years sooner, earlier when I got divorced, lost my quarter million dollar a year job. And I lost a seven-figure nest egg in the market crash of 2008. Holy had, moly. When it yeah, rains, so, it pours, huh? Yeah. And I had to, at 45 years old, I had to move in with my mom and dad in a retirement community, um, you know, in, in a thousand square foot home uh, or condo. So talk about shame because I lived in a $2.2 .2 million home in my marriage. Bringing this back to my son, what happened was, because of the work I did before that, I mean, I went through, I was in hell for, for mm -hmm. half a decade. I was in emotional hell. Mm -hmm. um, but the work, little by little, began to help shore up who I was from the inside out. Um, so I was prepared for this even more traumatic experience. And, and, I, and I just want to share one more thing. It broke me open so much into the concept of self-love that I wrote a book about it called What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? Mm -hmm. So that's where my son, I, I'm, I'm trying, I want to put those two pieces together because I don't think if I started a practice in the midst of this turmoil, I would have been able to survive emotionally anyway. I, I, I have to go back to this because there are so many people, you know, I'm, I'm in this world of healing from betrayal 
and they stay stuck in the victim yeah. mentality. And betrayal could be you could feel betrayed that you that you lost your son. You could feel betrayed that you lost your your business, the divorce, all of these things. And it it is. I think it's almost default. The default is to stay stuck and to and yeah. to 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 use that sort of victim card. And you had every reason to. So I, yeah. I, you know, you really did, right? I had every reason to, I could be drinking and, and mm -hmm. being, I could have been drinking curled up in a ball for a decade and mm -hmm. no one would judge me for it because of that. No, that, one, yeah, that's the that thing. reason. It, right. Exactly. So I want to dive into that deeper. And I know even just personally, I had two horrible betrayals and, and just from a lot of my own personal experiences and being in the ICU for 11 days, it's a miracle I'm alive. So there are so many experiences and I look at it and I say, I have every right to either be miserable or to be stuck or be whatever. And, and, you know, I look at your stories and you certainly have every right as well. And I, th and I really want to stress how it's, it's a choice. It's truly a you know choice what? because here's, here's you choosing not to opt for that, that route. So tell us, I, I will know say, how. I, I want to say the, the, my motivating factor is I know my son would never want me to suffer and to be stuck. Mm. I honor him by not being stuck. And it takes, and I'm not going to say this doesn't take a tremendous amount of courage, because again, I could choose victim consciousness. And sadly, here in the United States in particular, we are bombarded with victim consciousness. It's actually encouraged. So this is a country that encourages victim consciousness. And I'm here to say, I dishonor my child by being a victim. And for his, I, in honor of him, mm -hmm. I do not choose that. And I'm saying that almost boisterous. I'm saying that with a lot of passion right now because that is the greatest gift you can give to your loved one is not to choose victim consciousness. And whether they're, and sadly, you know, in the, in the eyes of betrayal, when someone does something to you and we point the finger at them, we have to remember that we were a part of that. You know, what happened to my son, that happened to him, not to me, okay? Mm -hmm. Let me repeat that. That happened to him. Not to me. The experience of it is different, mm -hmm. but his his passing was on him. Mm -hmm. When we're into we're when we're in relationship, and most betrayal centers around our interpersonal relationships. Choosing victim consciousness, all that does is allow one to suffer. And what is the point of suffering? Mm -hmm. There is no point of it. Mm -hmm. And that's why Brene, I love Brene Brown when she says forgiveness isn't for them, it's for you. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. benefit of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And by forgiving, we actually begin the path of inner peace. Let's talk about forgiveness because it looks yeah. so different for so many people. You know, and, and again, you mentioned that one big ta-da moment. And I remember when it was time for forgiveness, I thought forgiveness worked like that. <laughs> Where Again, it was this, there was this one big ta-da and it didn't quite work that way. It was more layers yeah. and stages and you forgive, but then you take it back and you forgive and you take it back. H how did forgiveness look for you? What was the process? So I, in, I internalized the word forgiveness as for giving love for mm -hmm. giving love. In other words, it's about giving love. And first, it's myself. Forgiveness is for myself. Not that I did anything wrong. That's the problem. There's such an association with right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is for giving love. So much like the, you know, when you're on an airplane, the flight attendant says, put the oxygen mask on. Mm -hmm. The oxygen mask is love. And what it is, is you're giving it to yourself first. Because if you don't give it to yourself first, you can't be of service to others. So forgiveness is forgiving love mm -hmm. and then giving love to others. Because no matter how bad someone treated us on a soul level, most everybody is a hurt, you know, well, they're on a soul level, everybody is loving mm -hmm. and their personality might have caused hurt and pain. But trust me, you probably wouldn't want it to grow up the way they did because they had a lot of pain and suffering that caused them to betray someone. Mm -hmm. So forgiveness, and I use a forgiveness prayer. I use the Hawaiian forgiveness uh, prayer. What is that? Hokamokamoka. <laughs> uh, it's called the Hapona Pona 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 Pona. And I'm just joking. It's it's Hapona Pona Pona. Uh -huh. And the forgiveness prayer goes something like this. 
I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Now, I say this to myself probably a dozen times a day. Whenever I'm feeling uncomfortable, whenever I'm feeling uneasy, when something is agitating me, I give myself love. And it, what it does is it, it interrupts the nervous system. It takes you out of that fight flight mode. And for a moment, it allows for a shift in energy. And then that creates an opportunity. So you're the words I'm saying. It's a, you know, it's a, it allows for a shift in energy and then creates an opportunity to choose a new way of thinking or a new pattern of thinking. And this takes a tremendous amount of practice to actually heal. This is not something you say it and it's done. Mm -hmm. You can't do a cord cutting and it's done. You can't go to a workshop and it's done. This is a daily practice because just like an athlete who wants to, like the Olympics are coming up this year, you know, who wants to win the gold, they practice, they practice, they practice, they practice, they practice. And it's the same with your own life. Practice right. this work. And I want to stress how powerful it is. It seems so simple. It's only four sentences, but I, rem but I, I, I don't fully know the story. It was something, I think there was a, a doctor or a therapist who went to Hawaii and there were all of these patients who could not be cured and he was something like, right. And, and he just, yeah. he was just brought in and all he did was say that prayer to himself and somehow the, these, these patients who were really struggling, uh, started started turning around and, and getting a little bit healthier or calmer and all these things. So do not underestimate the, the power of that Hawaiian prayer. And I won't even dare try to say the name. And so also, can I say something else about the sure. trail? Because you know what, here's the thing. I'm a believer lead by example. So in my divorce, and I don't want to go into the particulars, there was a lot of animosity between us. And I was in a relationship with a woman. She really encouraged me. Why don't you just send your ex love? Just send her love. Just send her love. And I continually, I reframed every conversation we had from a loving place. Like, for example, what would love do or how would love respond? And within a couple years, by doing this continually, our relationship began to improve. Now, here's the thing. Not everyone's going to have that happen. And, and it's difficult to do that if you're the one who feels betrayed. And... We can still give love. It's, it's good. It's not, just, it's not just good for them. It's good for you mm -hmm. because being in our loving is actually how we shift into inner peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's how we heal physically as well. Yes. So give us some more examples of, of how, how self-love can help us break through betrayals and hardships. Um, well, it boils down to this. When we're not, okay, there's a choice, love or fear. That's the two ways we operate. And within fear, there's ego, okay? So, so by choosing love, by leaning into love as a daily practice, and I know this sounds so airy-fairy to say the word self-love, so let me give you some other words that relate to self-love, is um, self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-reliance. All those words are incorporated with self-love, but really leaning into the word love. Sadly, many people see the word love as I'm a giver, I'm a giver, I'm a giver, and all they do is take, take, take from me. That's mm -hmm. victim consciousness. Because mm -hmm. a true person in their loving is just giving love to others, and when it comes from a sincere place, it will actually begin to come back. Well, and I want to stress that point too, because when it's coming from that place of lack, like I'm going to give so much love so that I get the love I don't feel I deserve, you know, or so, yeah. because I'm feeling you know, like the typical, that people pleaser, I give so much and hopefully it'll be returned so I can feel worthy and deserving. And that's yeah, those are the martyrs I talk. I call them the martyrs because I, I give so much and I get so little back. Again, victim consciousness. Mm -hmm. How about just, I give a lot of love. Great. Mm -hmm. You don't need to, you know, look, I, sometimes I just want to shake people, <laughs> you know, to get them unstuck, right? And I know you feel exactly the same uh -huh. way. Yep. Uh, it takes a level of awareness. It takes a level of being present and patient and recognizing that love is something you give. Love is not something you get. Mm -hmm. And I, lo I, I love that. And, and it, even it's interesting to me because even that you're stressing that this sounds like an airy fairy concept. and you you know it's almost like you have a phd in life 
So with all of your experiences, <laughs> right? And, I have so, 20,000 hours of coaching and I've done a, probably another 10,000 hours of work on myself. Well, so. that's what I'm saying. So, <laughs> yeah. so everybody listen here because here's somebody who has put in the time, the effort, the energy, the expense, and who has clearly done the work. And after all of these opportunities, really to see what you're made of, look how love rises to the top. And, and love is what you're stressing and love is what I I believe love saved you. Oh, absolutely. And, and I want to also um, recognize that some people have had severe trauma in their life in childhood or adult experiences. I mean, severe trauma. And in those particular cases, it, 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 you, there's more work that comes, more work that needs to be done outside of the mind. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I'm a huge proponent, if it's been real severe, that it's keeping one stuck, is to seek therapy, to seek professional help, to do mm -hmm. somatic, som am I saying it right? Somatic. Somatic. Uh, mm -hmm. Somatic. I don't know why I'm dyslexic on that word. Somatic therapy, which mm -hmm. is energy release work, which is getting it out of our body because traumas are stored in our body. The issues that, are in the tissues. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I love that. The issues mm -hmm. are in the tissues. I have to remember that. I um, didn't make that up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you, you, you did in my mind. <laughs> uh, so it it requires if there if one has had that much trauma, please, please, please go seek the help of real professionals because sadly we have a lot of coaches out there that are coaching, you know, from a real airy fairy perspective and that's not going to help those that have had deeper wounds my wounds as 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 hurtful as they were in my childhood and adult life they weren't deep and i wasn't so stuck and it's hard and, it, and my, for someone listening to this i you know how stuck you are mm -hmm. you really do mm -hmm. it just requires owning it in yeah. fact just own that you're stuck and 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 the stuckness is the recognition that you're not feeling inner peace because, you know, the Declaration of Independence says the pursuit of happiness. I'm here to say the, the pursuit of life, love, and inner peace mm. is the pursuit. Yeah. And those are yeah. some, those are wonderful goals right there. And, you know, I have to stress too, because uh, just the people that I've come in contact throughout the years who've had deep, deep trauma or what, you know, you may qualify as, as not as deep trauma, what I see so consistently the most joyful, love-filled people on the planet have been through some, some incredible hardships. And if nothing more than maybe because they have that perspective, they see how dark things can be. And they kind of say, you know what, I'm out of here. And, and, and really yeah. make that shift to something so far uh, on the other side. They swing so far from one side to the other because they see how painful something could be. Where someone maybe who hasn't experienced um, any, any trauma, you know, they're sort of kind of in the middle there where it's like, okay, not so good, not so bad. Yeah. And, and, but I do, I see that so consistently. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I did the Hoffman process, they uh, require you to fill out a questionnaire. Mm -hmm. It takes 10 hours to fill out the questionnaire. I mean, oh, it takes wow. that long to fill it out. I want to say it's 50 plus pages. Oh my gosh. Why this was so powerful was I've given this to friends who haven't done the Pro Hoffman process and they filled out the questionnaire and they go, oh my God, I learned so much about myself. Mm. And here's the thing. If one isn't willing to invest 10 hours into their own inner peace, but yet they'll binge, you know, they'll binge watch the Kardashians or, mm -hmm. you know, what's mm -hmm. happening to the housewives or that sort of thing. Um, why aren't people investing a half hour a day in their own self-love and not self-care? I'm not talking about manicures and pedicures mm -hmm. and massages. Mm -hmm. That's all about feeling good. I'm talking about, you know, emotional self-love. It's and an amazing, it's an amazing question because you're, you're absolutely right. Why is it that we find the time for things to numb, avoid, distract ourselves from ourselves. And when we can really, uh, improve whatever's going on in our lives by spending, doing the internal work, Jonathan, what do you want to make sure everyone knows as we wrap up? I can't believe how the time just flew speaking with you. Oh my God. You know, what's funny that popped in my head. Am I allowed to tiny curse here? Uh, we'll have to bleep it. 
Oh, no, no, in that case. Uh, okay. Well, then this isn't a curse. So uh, there was a book I bought years ago called Shut Up, Stop Whining, and Get a Life. <laughs> yeah. And what was interesting about that is personal responsibility seems to be so lacking. And I, I can understand depression makes it hard or feeling sad and lonely makes it hard. But on some level, we got to get some grit here. Mm-hmm. You know, we got to, not we. Okay, let me reframe that. I want to take away the word we. Mm-hmm. I chose, I chose to get my grit. I chose to like, you know, stand up with my shoulders straight and go, I'm going to lean into doing work on myself. I wasn't going to play the victim. And I want to just encourage everyone to just stand up for yourself and say, I choose me. I am tired of this and I'm going to choose me mm-hmm. as my, choosing my inner peace as the way I want to navigate life. And I hope maybe I've inspired a few people to just stand up and say that. I'm tired as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore as the I, scene in the I movie. know, yeah, I know you inspired many. How do we learn more about you? Where do we go? Well, thank you. I don't know if the show notes will have it, but I'm giving away a couple chapters of my book called uh, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway, which you can get at jonathanaslay.com forward slash love. Uh, certainly, I have a YouTube channel. You go check it out. I am shooting videos three times a week, um, putting out, you know, helping women understand. I work mostly with women, helping them understand men and be in better relationship. I'm starting a podcast soon called the what would love do podcast where we explore things from the eyes of love. And Mm -hmm. certainly you can Google my name and find me on social media. That's wonderful. Jonathan, thank you so much. I know you inspired our audience today. Oh, thank you, Dr. Debbie. I really had a lot of fun. I love how Jonathan decided to not get stuck in honor of his son. He had every reason to stay stuck and chose self-love as a way out. Stay in touch with Jonathan by going to jonathanaslay.com and we'll have all of his information in the show notes at pbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Here's my biggest takeaway. Imagine if you entered each challenging conversation or experience with the intention and thought, what would love do? Would you react, think, behave, or speak the same way? An interesting thought coming from someone who's living it. Once again, love wins. So what would love do? Invite you to take the post-betrayal syndrome quiz, of course. If you haven't already, be sure to take it at pbtinstitute.com forward slash quiz. And doors are open to the PBT membership community. Imagine everything you'd ever need to become your physical, mental, emotional best. Community support, certified coaches and practitioners you could schedule time with, daily classes on all kinds of interesting topics, curated experts teaching advanced strategies in the areas of health, mindset, spirituality, personal development. Imagine the most friendly, welcoming, and supportive place to become your best all online. I am so excited to welcome you. Just go to thepbtinstitute.com forward slash join to learn more. Thanks for listening. Can't wait to be with you next time. And here's to your breakthrough.